and my name is Brian Riley and I'm with the uh, Sun City West and the Surprise Tea Party. At this time, I'd like to ask Pastor John King to come up for the invocation. Let's all stand and bow our heads. Father, first of all, we just thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit to be here with us today. We ask that now, Lord, that you just let the Spirit of God move in each of the speakers that's going to speak. Lord, let the will of God take place in this meeting today. Bless each one here. Let them leave with the knowledge that you want them to leave with. And bless each one. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. May be seated. No, no. Please, please stand again. You have to understand he's a pastor, okay? He says prayers. Uh, I'd like to have Tom, I'd like to have author Tom Valentine come up for the uh, pledge, please. NBC here? Is CBS here? ABC? How about conservative Fox? Are they here? They're nowhere to be seen. I have personally invited every one of them to be here and nobody. Where's Sean Hannity? Where, where's Sean Hannity? The reason, the reason, the reason we're here is because the media is not covering this particular topic. We, we, America is in a horrible, horrible situation right at the moment, and we decided that it was time to get the, the word out to you people so that we can get word of mouth and spread the word about what is happening in America that you're not being told about. Uh, we have right now probably the biggest constitutional crisis since Watergate. And far, far bigger. Well, it's it's bigger in the sense that Watergate got coverage, and and the president had the best sense to stand down and step down so that he wouldn't get impeached. Nobody knows what's going on from the mainstream media as to what's happening here, and it's really really unfortunate because we're talking about the freedom of America, and we're talking about the president of the United States not having a clue of who he is at this point. So, I want to thank you all for taking a Saturday to come and hear this information. I want you to know that um, the reason the Surprise Tea Party and Sun City West Tea Party wanted to do this was that there were five members that the sheriff invited to attend the original press conference. We were, we were blessed, we were very fortunate uh, to go. Uh, the Surprise Tea Party was the original party that turned in a petition with 242 signatures for the pre uh, to the president to, to share. We can only share. Maybe he should be. Maybe he should be. So we, we turned in this petition to, to share up our pile. And I'll never forget his face when we walked in and he said, you're asking me to investigate the president of the United States. And we said, yeah, I, I guess we are. And so, uh, Jim Weiss, Julie Weiss, Jeff Lichter, my wife Denise Riley, and myself, we were fortunate to be with the sheriff. He took this on, and he said, through Mike Zullo, his main investigator, lead investigator of the cold case policy, he said, I am going to investigate this with the utmost diligence. And you know what? When our surprise tea party members were there, I said to the sheriff, 
The media won't cover this. The Congress won't touch it. The judiciary won't touch it. Nobody, the FBI, won't touch this. I said, you are the last hope for America. And I, I, believe, that, I believe that then, I believe it now. He is... I, I, basically, we were in the right state, with the right law, with the right sheriff to go forward with this. And we have a totally, totally unique situation in the state of Arizona because we actually have a criminal investigation going regarding the identity documents of President Barack Hussein and Obama II. And, and we have our sheriff to thank for this. The media, they criticized it, they attacked the messenger. And when we went to that press conference, we, the five civilians that had the good fortune of, of being invited by the sheriff, we, we saw some unbelievable things. We just saw some, un, and, and you are going to see some unbelievable things that the media has not told you about. They will attack the messenger. They will not. Uh, they will not address the facts. And today, we wanted you to come so that they could give this presentation. Hopefully, it will be similar um, to the original press conference. And and we're hoping uh, that you will spread the word of what is happening in America. I mean, you. This is the only law enforcement investigation that has happened in America re regarding this. So. What I'd like to do is introduce, I'm going to, par I'm going to partly introduce the sheriff because uh, Mr. Jeff Lichter will be coming up. He's the co-chairman of this event. But I'd just like to say that we went to the, we went to the right sheriff. We went to America's toughest sheriff. He He heads the nation's third largest sheriff's office, which employs over 3,400 employees. He served in the United States Army from 1950 to 1953, and as a Washington, D.C. and Las Vegas, Nevada police officer for almost five years. Arpaio went on to build a federal law enforcement career and rep reputation for fighting crime and drug, drug trafficking around the world. He began his career as a federal narcotics agent, establishing a stellar record in infiltrating drug organizations from Turkey to the Middle East, to Mexico, Central and South America, to cities around the United States. His expertise and success led him to top management positions around the world with the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration. He concluded his remarkable federal career as a head of the DEA for Arizona. In 1992, Sheriff Joe, Ar Ar Joe Arpaio successfully campaigned to become the Sheriff of Maricopa County. Since then, he has been re-elected to an unprecedented five four-year terms. During this ten his tenure as Sheriff of Maricopa County, Arpaio has consistently received high public approval ratings. Over, with over five decades experience in law enforcement, Arpaio knows what the public wants. He says, the public is my boss. He says, <laughs> he says, so I serve the public. This is the man that you want to go to to investigate the identification papers of the President of the United States. I would be really concerned if I was being tracked down by this man. <laughs> so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Jeff Lichter, the co-chairman of uh, this event, and I uh, appreciate you welcoming him. Thank you, Brian, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank all of you so very much for being here today. In just a few moments, 
we will deliver a message and a great welcome about and to our wonderful sheriff. But first, please allow me to begin by taking you back in time to two different events, one a long time ago, one a lot more recently. Almost all of us here are old enough to remember that famous vice presidential debate in the 80s between Dan Quayle and Lloyd Benson. Quayle tried to liken himself to JFK. And Benson fired right back by saying he was the friend of JFK and he knew him best and that you, Dan Quayle, are no JFK. Now more recently, just about a year ago, Representative Carl Seal, Kelly Townsend, and myself had the opportunity to meet with Donald Trump in his New York office. In that meeting about Obama's eligibility and our Arizona eligibility law, and I remember these words as if Donald Trump is saying them to me right now. What he said was that his sources in D.C. were telling him that a fake birth certificate was going to be issued. Three weeks later, on April 27th, our entire nation saw that predicted event take place. But in the weeks and months that followed, as the going remained kind of tough, Donald Trump became suddenly and increasingly silent. And now, in the many months that have followed since then, America's toughest sheriff became even tougher and appointed his cold case posse, headed by Mike Zulo, and together they proved the birth certificate to be a forgery. And so, to send this message and this welcome, please, can we again hear all of you join in in saying, Donald, thank you, but you, Donald Trump, are no Sheriff Joe Arpaio. federal guy with the U.S. Justice Department. Of course, they're following me around every day, but that's another issue. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just doing what I 
took an oath of office to do. I know it's corny to say that, but I firmly believe it. I firmly believe it. A lot of people say it. A lot of people talk. You need action. You can't just talk. So, and my wife tells me to shut up when I say this, and I'm not going to do it because where am I? I'm in Sub City West, Sub City, right? A lot of you people know me. Actually, they know me around. You call me the toughest sheriff in America. It's the world. It's not America. <laughs> just doing what I took an oath of office to do, but I'm going to get to, to tell you something, because now you'll know a little where I'm coming from, when I made this stupid mistake when I ran for office in 1992. You know what I said? The sheriff should be appointed and not elected. I would have been fired 20 years ago. I was, you think I'd be taking on the president if I was appointed? I'm elected. What are they going to do to me? And you mentioned, I report to the people. What, 250 uh, people signed the uh, petition? I don't need petitions, but it was nice. And uh, came to ask me to do something. I'm not accusing the president of any crime. When I took this on, I said to Mike, first of all, I think I was very smart. I don't like to give myself credit, but on this one, I'm going to give myself credit. Because I knew if I used taxpayers' money, it destroyed me. So I got a posse. 3,000 people. You see them in Sun City, Sun City West. I got a cold case posse. Why not give it to them? It doesn't cost a penny, so they can't go after me and say I'm using taxpayers' money. So, so I made up the next stops and got a few attorneys. You're doing a great job. Free. Doesn't cost you anything. So think of that. So I feel very strongly as a constitutional elected chief law enforcement officer for this county, which we have four million, right? A few extra floating around. I don't know where we have. <laughs> I'm not talking about snow birds. <laughs> Let's get to a couple of things first. Illegal immigration, you know, they're after me three and a half years. They're investigating. I don't know where that's going. But we're still doing our job. Judy and other uh, legislators passed two state laws on illegal immigration. I'm just enforcing those laws, too. Yeah. And we're the only law enforcement agency in the state doing that. So why have laws on the books if you don't enforce them? You know, I have demonstrators in front of my building. I see Sharptons in Florida. <laughs> well, he was here leading 10,000 people against me. Remember that? And he wanted me to resign. I love this guy. I want him back. You know why? Because I raised $50,000 that day. Who's this singer from Tucson? They're going to give her a war, an award for going after me. Uh, Olinda Ronstadt. Remember her? She went 10,000 uh, after me, uh, against me down the streets uh, to the tent city. And I, did, I have another jail next to the tents. So I played her songs so loud that they, they couldn't hear her blasting me. I want to do everything to clear the President of the United States. That was my, I wanted to do it, really. <laughs> you probably, some of you probably have said, we hope you don't. No, I'm a law enforcement guy. I wanted to be the guy to get up there and say, that birth certificate is legitimate, leave the President alone. But it didn't work out that way. <laughs> Start working on it. I don't know. There's some problems. And another thing we came up was the selected service for it. Now I see the media won't print it, and so all my press releases. I put a nice little uh, P.S. and I said I 
have registered 40,000 inmates to sign up for the selective service. I did that 10 years ago and still doing it. Then I said, we have 10,000 from another country. <laughs> when I started this, the U.S. government, the Selective Service System, didn't even know you have to sign up illegals, aliens. And I did. I got 40,000. So I take this serious, the Selective Service. Now, it's not a, I don't know about this coming up, the Selective Service problem that we have with the uh, president. This came up through our investigation. So what do you do? Throw that in a wastebasket? No, we're not going to throw it in a wastebasket. And once again, I'm not accusing the president of any crime. But we do have some probable cause on a couple of documents, government documents. And the last I heard, if you forge documents, it's I think that's a violation of law somewhere. If you did it, you'd be in trouble big time. I don't care who you are, unless you're the president. I don't care who you are. <laughs> the president mentioned me three, uh, three uh, months ago at the White House. What an honor. <laughs> he didn't like the way I'm enforcing the uh, immigration law. That's okay. Great. A lot of people don't like it. But that's a violation of the law. I think we locked up 85 in the last uh, two weeks. We, uh, we, we raided another business, grabbed uh, 32. A cockfighting ring, we grabbed uh, another 18. We just busted uh, uh, half a ton of marijuana with illegals. I do this all the time. You'll never see it in the media. But if somebody else, they see it. So we're going to continue our job, and uh, I really thank you for your support. I'm not anybody different. I, I just spent all those years in law enforcement, and I feel when the people want something done, you should at least try to do it. Might not be successful, but give it a shot. And that's the way I am. I spent. I lived all over the world. I was a diplomatic attaché. I, Worked in Turkey, the Middle East, director in Mexico, and South America, and Texas, and Arizona. Nobody asked me my opinion about the Mexican-U.S. border. Very interesting. From the president on down, nobody asked. And where is everybody? How come nobody say, at least saying, something about me, not that I need these politicians to do so, but they could at least say we got a nice sheriff. <laughs> and, or at least say, well, I don't know nothing about this, but let's see what the sheriff comes up with. I don't hear that. All I hear is he's here legitimately, that the birth certificate, certificate is okay, everything's okay. What is it? A 10-year-old can look at that birth certificate and know it's not real, I think, but Mike will explain that to you. So I don't know what's going on in this country. Greatest country in the world, in the universe, in the galaxy. So, anyway, I want to thank all of you. You, you give me the support. Uh, I need your support because without you, I'm finished. I, I've been re-elected about five times, and I started, uh, we're in Sun City, right? Yeah, we have some, we have some senior citizens around here. Or, huh? See, when I'm in Sun City, Sun City was, I always get my age. When I'm in Scottsdale, I'm 39. <laughs> when I'm in Sun City, Sun City was, I'm 79 going on 80. So, I'll be 80, uh, when, June 14th, flag day. You, you know what I'm going to do it, Mike? No, you know what I'm going to do I'm not ashamed to say my age. I'm going to take that 80, that phony 80, that was upside down on that selected. So I'm going to flip it, and that's going to be my birthday. I want that to be my birthday. I'm going to show that. Uh, I want every birthday card, the copy of that. Selected service for it. Okay? <laughs>
<laughs> anyway, thank you from the bottom of my heart. My wife uh, wants to take thank you. Know, this is tough for her too, uh, but uh, without her uh, backing and courage, it'd be tough for me to do my job the last 20 and the last 30. My other wife was very exciting too, uh, but uh, she's always backed me up. So I don't have a problem with a wife, you know, how come you never home, all you think is, I don't have that problem. <laughs> so I'll give a little uh, credit to the wife. Okay, we are, that was wonderful, wasn't it? I mean, was that fantastic? We are going to do a little bit of surprise tea party and Sun City West tea party uh, business at this point. And what we have done is we have developed a petition that is directed toward the state legislature and we are asking the state res uh, legislature to come up with a resolution that's approved directing the Secretary of State to write a letter to uh, Deb Debbie Wasserman uh, Schultz of the, of, of, the, of the DNC asking for specific identification paper papers uh, for Barack Hussein Obama II that is satisfactory to the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, to the Secretary of State, and the legislature. And we are, we're running out of time. The legislature is going to adjourn, uh, I think, in a couple of weeks. And uh, we want to make a last-ditch effort to get something done because we can't understand why any state would put uh, an individual on the ballot not knowing exactly who he is. It just doesn't make sense, folks. One of, one of the things that I've always said is that you should know the law better than they do. If you want to fight government, if you want to fight the opposition, know the law better than they do. And a fellow, the coach, the co-chairman, Jeff Lecter, um, he did a search and he found a statute in the Arizona Revised Statutes. And it's ARS 41-121-A1. I don't have a clue if this has ever been used before. Jeff found it. We're going to go ahead. We're going to try it out, see if it works, see if we can get some answers. And um, the, petition, the petitions uh, are being distributed right now. And Jeff and uh, fellow associates are going to be taking them down to the legislature. They're going to hand carry them down on Tuesday hoping that we can get something done next week. And what I'd like to do is introduce Jeff Lichter again. And he has got a, he wants to discuss the, the suggested letter that the Secretary of State could possibly come up with to get the information that we're seeking. Be, before I turn it over to him, just so you all know, I'll read the petition so you don't have to waste a lot of time reading it. It says, we, the undersigned Arizona citizens, are requesting that the Arizona House and or the Arizona Senate pass a resolution directing Arizona Secretary of State Ken Bennett to send a certified letter to Democratic National Committee Chairperson Debbie Wasserman Schultz, requesting that she produce certified source documents that are satisfactory to the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office that positively identify the U.S. natural born citizenship and the Selected Service System Registration of Barack Hussein Obama II. With the recent findings of the MCSO cold case posse, there is probable cause to believe that Barack Hussein Obama II's Selected Service System Registration form and his State of Hawaii Certification of Live Birth form are criminal forgeries. It is imperative to determine Barack Hussein Obama II's status regarding his eligibility to be placed on the 2012 Arizona ballot. That's it.
And again, Jeff Lecter. Again, thank you, Brian. Uh, just before I give you a little description about the letter, um, and as the petitions are getting started, uh, let me announce that we are going to supplement the petitions you are signing today on paper with an online petition. And we're going to get that out by email over the internet, but it would also help greatly. Whether you think you're going to be able to use this or not, you might think, I'm signing it here today, I don't know anyone else who will sign it, but I'm going to ask you if you can possibly take out a piece of paper and a pen to write down the link that you can refer to your friends, your relatives, and your neighbors in Arizona that were not able to make it here today to also sign this petition online. And we will bring the hard copies we receive here today plus the count that we obtain online to the legislature on Monday. So here, if you can pull out a pen and piece of paper and spread this, the link is as follows, and I'll read it a couple of times and as slow as I can. Uh, www.goo, and that's in small letters, dot gl in small letters, slash, forward slash, <laughs> dh in small letters, DBI in capitals. Right, I'll do that one more time. www.goo small letters dot gl small letters forward slash I don't see too many of you writing. Come on, we need you to use this. <laughs> forward slash small letters dh capitals D B I. Okay, thank you. Oh, dot uh, dot com. Okay. I add that dot com. I'm sorry. <laughs> what about them? The gentleman is asking, are John McCain and John Kyle here? Are you kidding? Does everybody want to laugh at once? Yeah. They're, they're part of the problem. They are the problem. <laughs> they are the problem. They are the problem. Repeat one more time, please. One more time? Okay. www. That's small. G-O-O -O dot G-L small forward slash d h small letters capital d b i dot com to pull up the petition that you're signing today okay i think they just put it up there okay Yeah. And again, I think you all know, but it's strictly Arizona residents to sign this petition. Okay. Since you've now all heard about the petition and the resolution to Secretary of State Bennett that we hope to obtain from either or both houses of our state legislature, because of this petition, I am now going to tell you a little bit about the letter that the resolution is inspect, expected to instruct Secretary of State Bennett to send to DNC Chairman, Chairwoman Schultz. To begin with, whether or not Secretary Bennett believes that he has the authority to keep an unqualified candidate off the ballot, we believe that he has at the very least the implied statutory power to do so. The resolution itself is not drafted yet, but will be within a day or so of delivering these petitions to the legislature on Monday. There has been a draft of the proposed letter constructed, but it is only just that at the moment a draft. At this point, because it will be up to the legislature in conjunction with a passed resolution to finalize that proposed letter. 
However, I can tell you that the current draft does address in more detail the same items that the petition refers to, including questions and evidence pertaining to natural born citizenship, the birth certificate, the selective service registration, and even the social security number. Amen. The letter will demand substantive answers to all of the questions posed that need to be satisfactory to the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, its cold case posse, the Arizona Legislature, and Secretary of State Bennett. The goals and the expected outcomes of this letter are as follows. DNC Chairwoman Schultz, on behalf of the President, can either choose to ignore and never answer the letter, or she can choose to offer up the standard dismissive responses we have been hearing from time to time over the last few years, which will be unsatisfactory to the, the entities just named. And based upon their record so far during the last few years, it is highly unlikely that Schultz will reply with the honest, substantive responses that will be asked for. So in conclusion, I ask you that if the expected occurs, that being either no response or answers at all, or the delivery of baseless, unsatisfactory answers, can Secretary of State Bennett go ahead and place Barack Obama on our ballot? Are we the people? Are you the people going to allow him to do that? We must take this stand. We must make our voices and our words heard. Thank you. Now here's the surprise about this uh, this resolution. This resolution does not have to be signed by the governor. It bypasses the governor. Okay. Uh, I'd like to take a few moments to introduce Mike Zulo of the Cold Case Posse. I remember when he called me on September 15th, and he said he had been he had been assigned as the lead investigator of the uh, birth certificate uh, investigation. I think he was just as surprised to get the assignment as I was to get the phone call, and uh, we had we had a discussion about it. Since that time, I've been I've been the gopher between the surprise tea party and the, the cold case posse. They want something. Fetched, I go fetch it. And through that process, I've gotten to know Mike Zulo. He is, I, I've gotten to know Mike Zulo. I've gotten to know every one of the members of the cold case posse. Since the materials were released at the March 1st press conference, I, I have seen these fine gentlemen and one lady uh, ridiculed, maligned, um, berated simply because they did their jobs to find the truth. Now, you have to hand it to these people. They have an extremely difficult job to do, and they did it. The sheriff assigned it to them. And, and I, want, I want you to know, I am very, very proud of having my wife and I having the ability to meet these people and knowing how hard that they've worked on this project. And so, I, I'd, I'd like to get around, a lot of them, most of them aren't even here because of other situations, but I'd like to give them a round of applause because they've done good. You, you folks are very, very fortunate to have them working for you. You really are. Uh, Mike, Zulo, Mike Zulo has a significant law enforcement background, uh, both with the, the MCSO cold case posse and on, from the East Coast. Um, 
I'm, I'm totally amazed by him. I mean, his dedication, the hours that he's put into this, the presentation that he will, he's told me that he's pretty much going to duplicate the presentation that he did at the, uh, the March 1st uh, press conference. And what you're going to see today is what we found, we were, we were awestruck when we saw this, and we were also awestruck that the media didn't show you guys. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce lead investigator Mike Zulo for the Cold Case Council. DBI in capitals. I, I, that's what I'm being told. Try it both ways, try it anyways. Either way, okay. <laughs> Let me start off with telling you that I truly, truly believe you are fortunate to have Sheriff Ohio. There are some things that I'm not going to be able to go into detail with, but I've been saying this now for the last four months, and I told the sheriff at coffee before we got here. There's kind of, you know, jokes around, you know, sheriff, American is tough as sheriff. I'm going to tell you that I think when this thing is said and done, Sheriff Ohio is going to be America's sheriff. <laughs> Sheriff Ohio has been a law enforcement officer as long as I have been alive. So Sheriff, well that's not a dig, sir. When Sheriff Ohio tells you there's a lot of smoke, you can take it to the bank that there's a forest fire. They need to heed to what this man is telling you. Going back to what Brian told you, I was shocked that we got this assignment. When I did meet with the sheriff, the sheriff did tell me, and I kind of snickered like you guys did, I want to clear the president. When I got done snickering him, it was pretty evident to me that it was true. He wanted this document cleared, he wanted the country to move on from this, and he didn't really know what was there, but he wanted us to find out. And that's what we did. The problem with this is we refer to it as a document, and you can't refer to it as a document. Because what it really is, is an electronic file. And in this age of technology, the game has changed. And what we did find out in the very beginning of this venture was to get forensic document examiners to really help us. They were prohibited from doing so because they would not render an opinion without first seeing the original document and using it as a basis of comparison. And Tom Valentine knows that all too well. There is no original document. And even if there is one, they're not giving it to us. And if you don't think the White House or the administration or the powers that be know that, they know that very well. So we were forced to conduct this in a rather unorthodox venture. And we did. And I, I believe that... Uh, Something else that has grown out of this investigation, before I get into the nuts and bolts of what's gone on here, if you look around here, there's probably a thousand some odd people here. The sheriff, the sheriff's office has been inundated with emails, telephone calls, some rather hateful comments, um, death threats on the sheriff over this. And the, sheriff. <laughs> and the sheriff's uh, threats detail did the uh, Trace one down and apprehend an individual. They incarcerated him over this. Well, he's, he's not incarcerated yet. He's been charged. Um, you didn't see that on the national media. It's, it's pretty ironic to me that everything this sheriff does basically goes all over the globe except for this issue or anything related to this. Um, but there's something unique that's happened here. 
this is probably one of those very rare occurrences that law enforcement and the citizenry can work in concert with each other. The information that we are getting was developed by citizens. It wasn't all developed by the cold case posse. You, do, you should give yourself a round of applause because people did it tremendously. Part of the job as an investigator is to take that information, is to take that information. I'm going to repeat that for you. Louder. Louder. Better? Okay. Part of, the, part of the job of the investigator is to take information, gather it together, go through it, see what's relevant, see what isn't relevant, but never forget it. Because you never know what comes up later on that something you deemed irrelevant is relevant. And that's what we've done. We actually became the repository for information across the nation. And, and that's just something I've never seen before. I, I think it, it's to the testament to the sheriff for having the foresight to take this and conduct this this way. It's because of that information, it's because of his leadership, because of his desire to serve you, to being a law enforcement officer that still obeys the rule of law and enforces the rule of law, we're going to be here today. What I'm going to show you is we put together for the press conference, we put together, I believe it's five or six little videos. They range anywhere from two minutes to approximately four minutes in duration. Better, worse. Better, worse, worse. Better. Why don't we just go with this and I'll take this thing off. Okay? These videos that we put together merely touch the surface of what we've done. This was done in a way to keep the media's attention, which is about as short-lived as 30 seconds. <laughs> we designed it in a way that we believe, like the sheriff said, even a 10-year-old could put this together. So what I'm going to show you first is a video that was challenging to us. When we got this assignment, we were instructed to look at a document that really wasn't a document. We were instructed to look at a file. A file released uh, August 27th, I believe, 2011, by the White House. A file that's purported to show the American people that Barack Obama was indeed born in Hawaii and is indeed an American citizen born on U.S. soil. When we took that document and opened that document up, we found anomalies in that document, like a lot of other people found. The document could be opened up in a certain file and it would show links and layers, Adobe Acrobat. Links and layers to us didn't in and of itself really indicate anything. What really did were the facts that it had links and layers that contained specific information. And that we found troubling. So what I'd like to do is let me show you the video first so you can understand what we saw. And then I'll comment on that. Can we roll that first video? What should President Obama's birth certificate have looked like after being scanned into a computer? In order to find out, we stripped away the document's green background, leaving only a black and white document. Next, the document was photocopied onto green basket weave safety paper. The document was then scanned into a computer and opened in Adobe Illustrator. Once inside Illustrator, the file is as it should be. It has one layer and one link. As the document is enlarged, we'll notice two more characteristics that confirm it was produced by scanning a paper document into a computer. First, the texture of the paper can be seen underneath the ink. Secondly, the image noise is consistent throughout the document as we scroll from top to bottom. So to recap, we have one layer, one link, and noise that is consistent throughout the document. So why didn't the birth certificate file released by President Obama behave the same way? 
Can the anomalies in President Obama's birth certificate be explained by the use of OCR software or perhaps by the fact that the document was optimized prior to being released? We'll explore these possible explanations in a moment, but first we'll take a closer look at President Obama's birth certificate. We've already seen what is supposed to happen when a paper document is scanned into a computer and opened in Adobe Illustrator. Now let's use Illustrator to open the PDF file of Obama's long-form birth certificate that was posted on WhiteHouse.gov on April 27th of 2011. At first glance, the document appears to have only one layer. However, a quick glance at the links palette indicates that there are many layers. Nine layers to be exact. As we turn each layer on and off, note the information each contains. As layers 1 and 2 are turned on and off, they appear to contain no information. As we will see later, nothing could be farther from the truth. Keep your eyes on box 20, 22, and the date stamp at the bottom of the page as we click layers 4, 5, and 6 on and off. Layer 7 contains the state registrar stamp, layer 8 most of the type, and layer 9 the green safety paper background. Perhaps most troubling is the way the date stamp and the state registrar stamp at the bottom of the page can be moved around the page in their entirety once they've been selected. This immediately caught the attention of Maricopa County Sheriff's investigators. You'll recall that when a paper document is scanned into a computer, we typically see an even level of noise throughout the document. So, does the PDF file released by the White House pass this test? No, it does not. As you can see as we scroll down the document, noise is not evenly distributed as it should be. Those who have attempted to defend the document's authenticity have relied primarily on two theories. One, that the document may have had optical character recognition software applied to it, or that because the document was optimized before being released to the general public, these anomalies are expected. As you will see, both theories are easily debunked. Everyone, you literally have the ability to pick up and move the state register stamp, which is the very item that gives this document its authenticity. It is the state telling you this is true, accurate, and correct, and we stand by it. We can pick it up and we can move it. The date stamp that tells you the day they came to that determination can be picked up and moved. The green safety paper background, the safety paper, it's called that, or security paper, because it gives you the secure feeling to know this is an official document and can't be scanned into a computer or played with, that can be turned on and off. So what does that start to tell us? Well, from a law enforcement perspective, just the mere fact that the register stamp can be moved, the mere fact that we learned that the register stamp was imported into that document from an unknown source, right then and there would have been enough for us to declare the document null and void. But it wasn't going to be enough for Sheriff Arpaio. <laughs> We had, to, we had to convince him, and we had to convince him in a way that he instructed us to handle this matter with utmost diligence, so we continued. The other side, and I call him the other side because there's no other way to really put it. You either believe it's a forgery or you don't. The other side is hard at work trying to give excuses as to why these anomalies occur. One of them that you see in there was OCR. Oh, my God. Optical character recognition. Really, that's a fancy way of saying you scan it into a computer and this software program picks up the characters, the fonts, the little letters, and makes them sharper, <coughs> makes them look better. They're trying to say that that software would then cause these anomalies. They also talk about something called optimization. Optimization is nothing more than you're going to take a file and launch it 
to a lot of people or up to a server, you can press the size of the document. Therefore, you're moving around certain characters, and they're trying to say that this would cause that. I'm going to show you the next video, and you're going to understand why we don't believe that to be the case. Can you do the next one, please? One of the theories put forth by those who are trying to defend the authenticity of Barack Obama's long-form birth certificate is that the many anomalies contained in the document are there because optical character recognition or OCR software was applied to the document prior to its release by the White House. What is OCR software and what evidence is there that this software was or was not applied to President Obama's long-form birth certificate before being released by the White House? In order to determine whether or not OCR software had been applied to the file released from the White House, we put it through a three-part test. First, can fonts be recognized in the document? Secondly, can words be searched for in the document? And third, can text be edited in the document? Before we look at Barack Obama's long-form birth certificate, let's take a look at a document that we know has had OCR software applied to it. This document started out as a piece of paper. It was scanned into a computer and then had OCR software applied to it. As we can see, fonts are recognized in the document, so it's passed the first part of our test. Next, we'll see if words can be searched for in the document. Let's try the word constitution. And there it is. The document has now passed the second part of the test. Now we'll see if text within the document can be edited. Indeed, it can. The document has passed all three parts of our test. We can state with 100% certainty that this document did have OCR software applied. Now we'll put the file released by the White House through the same three-point test. First we check to see what fonts were identified. As you can see, no fonts were identified, therefore the document fails the first test. Now we'll search for a word that we know is in the document it would seem that no matches were found. The document therefore fails the second test. Now we'll see if we can edit text in the document. We can't even highlight text so that it can be edited. The document therefore fails the third test. We can say with 100% certainty that the document was not put through OCR software. If the use of optical character recognition software isn't responsible for the many anomalies in Barack Obama's long-form birth certificate, what about optimization? We'll explore this theory in our next video. Before we move on to optimization, I heard some of the reaction in the crowd. That was some of the reaction that we had. As this is going on, we're starting to really get a clearer picture that this document is manipulated, that this document is being built, it is being constructed, that there is human intervention, human logic, and no computer software are generating these anomalies. The next video you're going to see is going to talk about this optimization, this compression. This was the second hurdle we had to overcome, because the other side is saying this causes it. Now, you saw what happened the first time. What do you think is going to happen on the second one? Not going to fly. It doesn't work. It's really not there. And for those of you that are seeing this for the first time, you're seeing it the way we saw it when we put it together. You start to really look at this and you start to question just about everything. And, and I will share this with you before we go on. You have to question everything today. Everything you see, every picture you see, every document you see. Let's put the next video up and we'll move on. Optimized, a fancy way of saying that a file has been drastically reduced in size.
So, was there a good reason for optimizing Barack Obama's birth certificate before posting it on the internet? Given the anticipated number of downloads, yes, a smaller file would be beneficial. Now for the big question. Can optimization explain the many anomalies in Barack Obama's birth certificate? In order to find out, we'll once again perform a little experiment. You'll recall that we took Barack Obama's birth certificate, removed the green background, then photocopied it onto green basket weave safety paper. Next, we scanned it into a computer. This time, we also optimized the document. We'll now begin a series of comparisons between the control document and the one released by the White House. Let's start with a look at layers. Optimization produced 45 layers in our control document, which is to be expected with a document of this complexity. The document released by the White House had only 9 layers. Now let's look at the green safety paper background. As we look at this sped up version of layers in our control document being turned on, you'll note that the green background layer is divided over many, many layers. This is to be expected as a result of the optimization process. The birth certificate released by the White House has 100% of the green background on the ninth and final layer. As you have seen by looking at the control document, this is not an expected result of optimization and implies strongly that the green background layer was created on a computer and inserted behind the other layers as the last step in the computerized document creation process. And now we'll look at the registrar's stamp and the date stamp. The date and the registrar's stamp are contained in part on layer 1. I'll lift layer 1 off of the document so you can see. There you go. Part of the date stamp, part of the registrar's stamp. Now the date stamp is also contained in part on layer 7 and on layer 27. The registrar's stamp, in addition to being contained on layer 1, is also contained on layer 6. Note that both stamps took some of the green background with them. Suffice it to say that the date stamp and the registrar's stamp in a document that has been optimized cannot be moved around the document in one piece at will. Now let's look at the certificate of live birth released by the White House. As you can see, both the date stamp and the registrar's stamp can be moved anywhere you want in one piece. No green background going with it, lifted cleanly off the document. As we know from our previous example, this is not caused by optimization. Now let's look at the white halo issue. As we look at our control document, we can see that there is no white halo effect caused by optimization. Even as we zoom in and look closely between the letters, we can see that the white halo effect does not exist and therefore cannot be blamed on optimization. As we zoom in on the document released by the White House, we can see the white halo effect throughout the document. And while we do not know what caused this white halo effect, we can state with confidence that it was not caused by optimization. There are numerous ways a white halo effect can be manufactured within Adobe Photoshop. The exact way that this particular effect was manufactured is not important. All that is important is to note that when you scan a document into a computer and optimize it, a white halo effect is not produced. In conclusion, we can state that while optimization can result in a layered document, the layers found in Barack Obama's long-form birth certificate are very dissimilar to what we'd expect as a result of the optimization process. In short, optimization doesn't explain a single anomaly in Barack Obama's long-form birth certificate. Not a single one. As you can see by that video and those illustrations, we have defeated two of the major arguments 
that have been given for the validity claim of the document. Being able to pick up a registered stamp as a block and move it, leaving a white background, being able to pick up a date stamp and move it, leaving a white background. In addition to that, those aren't the only items on this document that you can do that with. The fact that it was leaving a white background was perplexing to us. Why was that occurring? Further analysis, and this is over a 16 hour period, further analysis revealed one of the most shocking things we came to learn. We learned that the green safety paper background, that green piece of paper that tells the world this is an official document, was actually applied last in the creation of the document. In other words, what they did, if you will, this is not a document, they used a white palette. They laid on all the information that they wanted there. They pulled off a copy of an original register stamp from another document, another source document, laid that on the document. They placed the date stamp on the document. And then what they were left with was a black on white image, black font, black text on a white background. Well, that's not where they stopped. They decided to make it look really original. What they did is they took a swatch through a computer program of what green safety paper looks like, put it in the corner, and then pressed a replicate button. What that does at that time, it fills in all those white spots, but what it can't do is fill in anything that's already taken up in black character font space. So now when you lift the register stamp off, you're left with that white ghost. That's why it's like that. It was the last thing they did. This also leads us to believe that this document never started its life as a paper document. In other words, they didn't take Obama's birth certificate, scan it into the computer, maybe try to pretty it up a little bit, press a button here, and let this look a little nicer here, and upload it. There was no document to scan in. They built it. It resides in cyberspace, in the mind of a computer, and it does become a paper document. That's after the print button is pressed, but not before. So we're going to show you a conclusion video that's going to bring this all together, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit. I got permission from the sheriff to share a couple other things with you. I can't go into great detail, but we're not finished. Let me put it to you like that. Over the last 10 months, there have been numerous attempts to defend the authenticity of Barack Obama's long-form birth certificate by offering up speculation and conjecture. Unlike those who defend the authenticity of the document, we were not willing to merely speculate or engage in conjecture. Instead, we created our own control document and scanned it into a computer. Many have falsely claimed that optical character recognition software was applied to Barack Obama's long-form birth certificate in an attempt to explain away the document's many problems. You'll recall that because fonts were not recognized in the document and text could not be successfully searched for or edited in the document, we concluded with 100% certainty that OCR software had not been applied to Barack Obama's long-form birth certificate. Now we'll apply optical character recognition software to Barack Obama's long-form birth certificate. Once we're done, we'll apply the same three-point test to Barack Obama's birth certificate. This time, we should see drastically different results. First, we'll look under the Properties tab to see if fonts were recognized. As you can see, they were. Next, we'll see if we can search for a word in the body of the text. We'll choose the word Live since we know that it's there. And as you can see, the word was quickly found. Now we'll see if we can edit the word that we found. 
As you can see, once a document has had OCR software applied to it, you can edit text with ease. Many have also incorrectly suggested that optimization is the panacea for all that ails the long-form birth certificate. But optimization produces layers very different from the layers found in the long-form birth certificate released by Obama. The document released by the White House had only nine layers. Our control document had 45 layers after being optimized. All attempts to replicate the layering effect through optimization on the long-form birth certificate or a document of similar complexity have resulted in considerably more than nine layers. In instances where a low number of layers has been produced, the documents being optimized have typically been rather simple in nature as when author John Woodman used a page from Little Red Riding Hood. In addition to the number of layers being different between the long-form birth certificate released by the White House and our control document, there is another very important difference regarding the layers. As we turn on all 45 layers of our control document, you'll note that there seems to be no rhyme or reason to the organization. Contrast this, if you will, with the long-form birth certificate released by the White House, where layers 4, 5, 6, and 7 all deal exclusively with stamp information. Are we to naively believe that this is the result of a randomized computer optimization process? The fact that the registrar stamp and the April 25th date stamp appeared separately and independently of each other on separate links drew our attention to the fact that they resided on separate independent layers. The fact that the date and registrar stamp were linked and layered in this fashion brings us to the conclusion that they were brought in from unknown sources and placed in a long-form birth certificate document released by Barack Obama to give the appearance of legal certification. Also troubling about the April 25th stamp and the registrar's stamp is the fact that both stamps can be lifted cleanly off the document and moved about the birth certificate in one solid piece. It should be noted that none of the self-proclaimed computer experts claiming to be able to replicate the layers in Obama's long-form birth certificate has been able to replicate this effect with the April 25th date stamp and the registrar's stamp. This document is far too problematic to discuss all of its issues in one press conference. Please note that the issue we are most concerned with is that of the date stamp and the registrar stamp which appear to have been imported from unknown outside sources. For if the date stamp and the registrar stamp, which are placed on the document to give it authenticity, are fraudulent, then the entire document is fraudulent. Like I said earlier, that's just the surface. We do believe the document is fraudulent. We alerted Sheriff Ohio early, early on that we were coming to this conclusion. Um, he instructed us to continue. He instructed us to go further, which we are going further. Um, that is, that's very troubling. Uh, you're the American people. You would think that the person holding the highest office in the land would be able to produce a legitimate birth certificate. It would have been just as simple to have taken a photograph of that birth certificate and put it up on the internet. You couldn't have done anything like that. It would have been just as simple to go to the Department of Health in Hawaii, take that document, put it in encased in bulletproof, nuclear-proof glass if it's that important to you, and put it on display for the public to go and see. He doesn't have one. <laughs> Think I'm agreeing with you. Well, let me back up. He may not have one. He's got one, but it's somewhere else. Going forward, I told you that I would share some things that the sheriff has given me permission to. Um, 
We were expecting at the press conference, before we get to even something more shocking, the selective service card, we were expecting the press to start taking apart our analysis. They didn't. The first shots they came out with was trying to take shots at the sheriff. I, it, 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 I was flabbergasted. I had never experienced anything like this. And I, I want to tell you a quick story about the sheriff. This, this is the kind of guy, just why I volunteer my time for him. He called me up a couple of weeks before this was going to go, and he goes, Mike, sheriff. I go, yeah, I know. <laughs> I have his badge that says sheriff on my phone. I ain't know when it's him. Um, he goes, I want you to know something. I don't want you to lose any sleep over this. <laughs> he says, even if you screw this up, even if you're wrong, I've got your back. That was good. I told him, number one, we can't be wrong. And I also told him I would not quit until this was finished. My team will not quit until this is finished. doing an investigation is the cooperation of evidence. In other words, you have somebody tells you something here, you've got to go out and find another source that can confirm that or get close to it or validate it in some fashion. Well, I have about five experts that we are using, and they come from different disciplines, different backgrounds. Some are great with electronic files, other document experts, typesetters. And I'm going to share with you some of the other things that we found on the surface, I asked Sheriff Arpaio to consider another press conference enabling us to go deeper into what we found. And um, that's up for his consideration now. Just a little pressure there, boys. <laughs> the typewriter evidence, the typewritten fonts that you see, a typewriter will always place its fonts equally apart. That doesn't happen on this document. The letter spacing is uneven. The word spacing is uneven on many lines. The line spacing varies one to three points, being either too long or too short. This information is obtained from a typesetter who for his life, time, career, was typesetting things as terrible as math books. You have to know what you're doing to typeset a math book. I'm sure I doodled in a couple of his in my day. <laughs> there is the distinct possibility, and we're looking into it a little further, that the registrar stamp may not have even been done by the official metal embossing stamp that it should have been. The certificate numbers are out of sequence compared to the date numbers issued by the same Department of Health only three days later. Federal mandate, it is consecutive numbering. This one isn't. There is the presence of a graphic image feature calling unsharp, unsharp mask on Obama's certificate of live birth. It's a software feature that's found in Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator. That could be one of the reasons for the white halo, but the white halo really shouldn't be there. There is also a difference in the colors of the text. There's a difference in the letter A on one line compared to the letter A on another. The letter H on one line compared to the letter H on another. Now I hate to break the bubble of computer geniuses and hackers, but this is old school police work and this is about ink. And there are people out there that know what they're talking about, and you can't get away with it. The two different typewriters, we believe, were utilized in the creation of this document. What that really means in today's language, this is a cut and paste job from two different or three different birth certificates. This is atrocious. This is beyond amateuristic. I, I don't even know what you call this. Melanie.
That was good. <laughs> we have a lot of digging to do. I, I am entertaining the thought of maybe doing a, a round table with the experts all in the same room. I, I cringe about that though because these people are so ingrained in what they believe they try to devour each other if somebody comes out and says something else. Um, but I, I am hoping that we do have an opportunity to go deeper into this document because if we do, some of it's a little mind numbing, but when it's done, there is no doubt. We believe, like the sheriff said, there is probable cause to believe that this is a forgery. We are on the hunt to find out who did it, and we have some pretty good ideas. I mean, can you believe you're getting all this for free? I mean, you're getting all this for free. This got to be a couple hundred thousand up to now. Are you getting it for free? That is, it is for my country. You're exactly right. And we love you for it. It's for my country. It's for my family. And it's for my children because this country is changing before my eyes. We'll take some questions later, just to hang on to them a minute. I want to move on to something that came to light that was even more shocking, especially for me, um, was the selective service card. I'm not even going to talk about it. I'm just going to show you the video, then we'll comment on it. Um, and then we'll take some questions after that. And I'm going to ask the sheriff to come back up here and answer some questions. You, you go with that? I don't know. He's not giving me the happy look. Okay. <laughs> I'll hear about that on Monday. Can we, uh, can we roll the next video, please? Was Barack Obama's Selective Service Card really received by the Post Office on July 29, 1980? What exactly is the concern with Barack Obama's Selective Service Registration? We reviewed multiple Selective Service Registration Cards. These are just four examples. Notice the date stamps on all four contain four digits for the year decade marking. This is a copy of the date stamp from Barack Obama's original Selective Service Registration Card that was made available for public review. These photographs illustrate a standard PICA stamp that was used during the 1980s era. The photograph on the upper right shows the PICA stamp compartments and stamps that needed to be changed out daily, monthly, and yearly. The picture on the bottom right is an example of a loaded PICA stamp. These five examples are the expected results from the PICA stamp used by the United States Post Office. The two examples on the far left are from the same post office where Barack Obama supposedly turned in his Selective Service paperwork. Per the United States Post Office, it is policy to use a stamp that contains four digits for the year. The stamp below is Mr. Barack Obama's and it contains only two digits for the year. Why? This photograph shows a PICA 2008 year stamp and a PICA 80 stamp. Since there are no 1980 PICA year stamps available, the 2008 was cut between the two zeros and inverted. This inverted cut stamp creates a similar effect, which closely resembles the one seen in Barack Obama's Selective Service Registration Card. This illustration shows what the 2008 PICA stamp looks like when cut in half and then inverted. In conclusion, as you can see by looking at the side-by-side -side comparison below, there is a clear difference between the authentic stamp shown on the right and Mr. Barack Obama's on the left. Look at the distance between the zero and the innermost circle of the stamp. Look at the distance to the right of the zero and beneath the zero. The reason the numbers 8 and 0 are out of position on Barack Obama's registration card is because when the numbers 08 were cut away from the year 2008, they were not cut squarely. Or perhaps put another way, 
the person who cut them cut too close to the zero. So when zero eight was turned upside down to become eight zero and put back into the pica stamp, it pushed too far to the right. In what is becoming a clear pattern for documents that are essential to the documentation of Obama's life narrative, the Selective Service card isn't just forged, it's poorly forged. At least I got a rise out of you, the media wasn't happy. <laughs> From my perspective, the sheriff couldn't see it because he was seated like he is here. The mouths dropped, the eyes got big, and the flash bulbs started going off, and they started writing in their little pads really fast. No one has made a comment about that card. Now, you go back to 1980, it was under Jimmy Carter, and I know what I remember it well because I was in a bar drinking when it came out and said, you all got to register for selective service. We drank more. Nobody wanted to pull a Vietnam move, nobody wanted to go, you know. They didn't want the haircut. Now it isn't gonna matter, but then they didn't want the haircut. You were required by law to present yourself in the United States Post Office, fill out the card, sign it, present identification, and then have it stamped received by the post office. That stamp that you see on that card isn't the stamp of canceled mail. It's the stamp of some clerk saying, I got this card in 1980. Now, we don't think that happened. As a matter of fact, if you start putting some of the pieces together, going to educational history, and we released some information, um, I think it was seen on WND, about a post office employee who had a conversation with Mr. Obama in the early 90s where he was purported to be a foreign student. We don't believe he would have registered if he was getting financial aid going to college here under a foreign visa. But now it became a problem because if you're here getting college aid under a foreign visa, let's see, last I checked, that doesn't make you a citizen. <laughs> So going, going, going forward, that card carries penalties. Five years in prison for failure to do so. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollar fine. But it also says something to the effect that you can't hold public office. Now, let me back up one minute. They're probably going to come out and say, but he's elected. Oh, well, he's getting a paycheck. It's public office. It's paid, it's paid for out of your dollar. So that card to us, from our perspective, that card carries even further significance than the birth certificate. And let me explain to you why we believe that. There is no one in this room that can tell me, including myself, where, when, what time, and to whom I was born at or to. Your reason is you weren't cognizant of the event. You don't know where you are. Now that being the case, how does somebody figure this out? Well, you have that little pesky thing called the birth certificate. But in 2000, the Inspector General wrote a second report on the rampant birth certificate fraud problem facing this country. And in the opening paragraphs of that report, he tells you that a birth certificate was merely instituted to record the event of a live birth. It's not to be used as a sole document determine citizenship or identity. But the problem with a false birth certificate that gets passed off as, a, as real is it becomes what's called a breeder document. It breeds from itself, 
legitimate documents, driver's license, social security cards, firearm permits, real estate licenses, passports, social security cards. That was a problem that was identified. And I'm going to borrow, he's left, but I told uh, Tom Valentine I was going to borrow the title of his book, O'Reilly O'Reilly. <laughs> Bill O'Reilly made, made a video basically challenging this. He, he didn't have the decency to call up the sheriff and invite him on his television show. He did a video on his own private little video channel. I don't understand how that thing works. And basically, he's hanging his hat on the fact that his people have researched into this birth certificate issue. And because there are newspaper clippings from 1961 <laughs> showing Barack Obama II being born on that date, that there's a zillion to one chance that it is in him. Therefore, he's taking a newspaper clipping saying that trumps the birth certificate that we just showed you. Oh, really, O'Reilly? I've got a news flash for you. I don't know who does your research, but I hope they do better for your show than they're doing on this issue. Because the fact of the matter is, in Hawaii, in their infinite wisdom, they allow the registrations of foreign-born individuals in that state, and they are issued certificates of live birth. We have over a thousand of these that are, I believe are Japanese citizens that that document exists. On top of that, we also know that in that registry that he's talking about, there are two known, and there's probably more, but two known adopted individuals that were breathing one to three years before they were adopted, and hence when they were adopted, they were issued brand new certificates of live birth. Now, I don't know how you do your math, but that's not working. The newspaper, what they would do, would they would go to these offices and every month pick up this registry, these, the number, it's just a line item registry, pick them up and just print them in the newspaper. They don't tell you a mother and father married, is it a single marriage? They don't tell you where they were born, what hospital they were born in, it's just one line. It was a common practice, especially in the early statehood of Hawaii, for foreigners to register live births in other countries in an attempt to get citizenship here in the United States for that individual. That led us to another problem. How do, how do, where do we go to find out anything about him? What, if he wasn't born here, what do we do? So we decided to reach out to airlines. We knew it was Pan Am at the time and TWA to see if we can get passenger manifests for international traffic into Hawaii. Obviously, you know, they're, they're gone, long gone. There's no way to get that. We contacted the National Archives in Washington, asked them the same question. After a number of weeks, they got back to us and they told us that, uh, no, we don't have passenger manifests. But what we do have are microfilm copies of every INS, an immigration card, of anybody coming into the country on an international route via air into Hawaii. So on the phone, I kind of started jumping up and down, high-fiving the air, because that's better than a manifest. That's from the government. We asked for copies of those, and we asked for a 10-year span of time, 685 rolls of microfilm were copied on your dime. <laughs> that was good though, it's a good use of your money. Obviously, we're a little restricted in our travel due to being a, a for donation cause, but Jerry Corsi was in that area. And I asked Mr. Corsi if he would go down and inspect the month of August 1961 with particular attention to the weeks preceding or, or post August 4th, 1961, the purported birth date of the president. 
Mr. Corsi was down there for about three hours and I got a telephone call. I go, did you find it? He goes, no. I go, okay, so what's up? He says, well, I'm going through rolls of film and when I get to the roll marked August 1st, 1961 to August 10th, 1961, it's missing. I go, what do you mean it's missing, Gary? He's, Mike, it's just not here, it's blank. And it resumes right on the 10th on the next reel. And they look through number. They look through all 685 of these, but they look through a majority of these, and they didn't find that occurrence anywhere. We notified the sheriff. wasn't happy. We kept going at them. We asked them for a letter telling us what happened here. We had a push for that letter for a while. They finally sent us a letter. It, it's ambiguous. It says we don't know. Maybe this, but we don't know. They went on a hunt to find it. They couldn't find it. We then asked them for the two certified copy rolls. We had them certify those rolls for us. We now have those rolls in evidence. And the sheriff then decided, well, we need to do something about this. So we are going to look deeper into that issue and probably request some further explanation from them. But the sheriff also decided, it's time to get some information on the selective service card. So Sheriff Opio sent off a letter on his stationery to the Director of Selective Service, informing him that we were conducting an investigation and we would like to work with them if they would help us. Can we please see the original document? We would like to send down some deputies and a forensic document examiner to inspect it. We gave them a 30-day reply. I think I back to us in a matter of days if, if my memory serves basically telling us they didn't think there was anything wrong with that registration card, and if we thought we had the evidence, you could turn that over to the FBI. <laughs> I think we need to send uh, the director of Selective Service uh, Sheriff Rapilo's books because he doesn't know who he's talking to. <laughs> that didn't work. Subsequently, the sheriff has now sent off another letter, and he has asked, again, if you have the card, and if you do, can we see it? I'm sure we'll keep you updated on that response. Looking at everything that we have here today, looking at that selective service card, I mean, that is obvious forgery. That selective card, that selective service card, I reproduced that in my living room. <laughs> Through investigation, we got a circa 80 date stamper, the red handle thing. I had a call uh, a post office supply house and get the Pica 40 stamps that are the government issue. Government mandate, DOD instruction says it has to be a four digit year stamp. We had this looked at by retired postal employees, postmaster generals, they all said there's something wrong. To offset that, there's only one way, you cut it wrong. Something that we didn't alert you to in the video, we also we knew it, we just didn't want to give the media everything at the time. The top of the eight is severed. And it's severed straight. And it's done for a purpose because when you turn it back the way it's supposed to be, the belly of the eight is bigger than the top of the eight. So they had to conceal that fact. There are other issues with the card that we're going to hold close because the sheriff is going to use them if we get stonewalled again. But we're expecting to put forth some other requests from the sheriff to other agencies, and we'll see what happens. I'm not holding my breath. But we continue to go. I also want to let you know that this investigation is multifaceted, and it is now going beyond not only the borders of Arizona, but it is also going international. I can stand up here for a couple hours and tell you things, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you only what I can tell you that I can prove. So, we're, like I said, we are not going to entertain conjecture or speculation. I will take a couple questions and, and go from there. Let me just start from right to left and we'll, we'll get there. I'll start left to right. Hold on. Go ahead, sir.
does that not nullify every single document Obama has signed in the entire time he's been in office? I'm not a constitutional attorney, obviously. I, 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 there's, there's different thoughts on that. Some things were voted for by Congress. You would think on face of it, yes. But I don't know. I, I, you know, that's going to be an issue for the powers over there to determine. We're very, very far from, from that. Can we access the videos? Yeah, you can actually get the videos on our website. It's really easy. It's not as complicated as the other one. It's www.mcsoccp.org. Mcsoccp.org www.mcsoccp.org Maricopa County Sheriff's Office Cold Case Boston. Hi, son. Yeah. Um, you know, dumb question or else way too complex to answer. What is the agenda? These people know that what we're saying is true. Who is protecting Obama? Who's running this whole thing? We agree with you that there is an agenda. We don't know who's running the whole thing. Um, I will tell you that we did receive information from three separate independent sources telling us that major media networks were threatened with criminal investigations, FCC investigations, and some people's safety was threatened. Um, we got information that it was Soros operatives. We're not entirely sure who it was, but we know that there's a major media blackout. And you know there's a major media blackout. Go ahead. The lady and the gentleman that signed the, the two documents that you referred to, the birth certificate and the, the uh, selected service uh, card, They've got to be our age. Can they not be subpoenaed and, uh, and uh, under oath? The question as to whether or not they signed these documents. We would have to find that information from them. They would have to provide for us. But it's not even going to just be selective service. It's a post office employee. How about the name on the certificate? Barack Obama's name? No, her name. We would have to get that information from them. They're not cooperating with us right now. Sorry, I understand that. We would have to get that information from them. You could you could hunt down names like that from now to the end of time. I'm not going to know who it is. It's not going to be that. I understand what you're saying, but we have to get that information from them. That person would have to be employed there. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the truth. But sometimes making contact with those people too early on is, is not the opportune thing to do. Two quick questions. Uh, did you look into the social security card he carries? Because there's supposed to be some dead guy in Connecticut. And second question is, in concocting this thing from scratch, like you say they did, what would have happened if they had started with the green safety paper to begin with? Let me take the latter question first. The green safety paper, what would have happened is you would not be able to separate the blank black ink from the green color you wouldn't get this ghosting effect of solid white. You just couldn't do it, it would bleed into it. We are actually conducting tests now and we are still coming to the conclusion that it's a cut and paste. We tried it that way. We're trying it as if it was a legitimate document scanned into the computer the way they were trying to say. It still doesn't cut it. You have the other. Social Security card is, is still a mystery. It's not something that we're, uh, we're, we're pursuing as diligently at this point. The Social Security number has been flagged by the federal government. In other words, if you run it, they're notified and the information goes blank. We can't affirm or deny who may have had it beforehand. The one thing we do know I can't figure out why would a 16-year-old boy who's going to high school playing on a basketball team 
Travel 3,500 miles to Connecticut with no known place to stay, no relatives over there, never saying he was there, and apply for that card. That just doesn't really fit either. And I, and I want you to understand something. Some of the people that he's associated with, the likes of Bill Ayers, those people are the kings of falsifying identities. You know, he claims he doesn't know, and we have information to the contrary. Mike, at the press conference in Phoenix, you said that there was a person of interest that was at a computer 20 minutes before it was uploaded to the White House. Was that found at the earliest of your investigation or latter? The person of interest that I'm referring to is not the person who uploaded it to the video. What I said in the press conference was, I would like to start with the person who pressed the upload button. That would be the last person to handle this file before it went to the world to see. So you would take that information, you'd start with them, and then you simply start asking questions. Who handed it to you? Who handed it to that person? You start working backwards. And eventually you find the origin, unless it gets stopped by some mysterious, nefarious means. Go ahead, ma'am. Once you finish your investigation, and everything is good. Once you finish the investigation and everything is found to be um, illegal, <laughs> what would the next step be as far as proceeding with actually bringing this to light and seeing what he does? Sheriff Opayo has asked for a congressional investigation, really wanting to look for a special prosecutor. This is the problem. This normally would go to the federal government to investigate. <laughs> Are you really going to give it to Eric Holder? No. no. This is why the sheriff is continuing on the way he's going. We're going to accumulate as much information as we can, and we're going to package it, up, package it up to pass it off to someone eventually. But he's going to do something rather unique. This is really a little unorthodox in investigation. He's going to keep the public informed. So now the public knows what we hand off, and they're going to want the answers. Two more to bring up. Uh, real quick, is anybody from the cold case posse or Sheriff Joe going to testify on April 16th in Mississippi? This question has come to me ever since we, we did our press conference. I've had numerous requests for an affidavit. People that have ballot challenges going on in the country are trying to subpoena the sheriff to go over there and testify to, to put forth our information. Let me be clear. This is an ongoing investigation, and being as an ongoing investigation, not that I expect it to happen, but you could always come up with a piece of information that all of a sudden wipes out everything you just did. So we're not going to go out and testify to these things if we could help it, because it is ongoing. When it's ongoing, you really can't talk about much. So th that answer would be, you know, I hope not. I'm not going to say no, but I hope not. We also don't want to partake in ballot challenges that are underway and, and, and possibly jumping on a sinking ship as if they're thinking this is going to be the life preserver. If there's going to be a ballot challenge, it should be done here in this home state of Arizona, starting in Arizona. Oh, her behind you and then you. Just wait in the back, go ahead. Thank you, and uh, I commend you for the work you're doing. Thank you. Um, are you able to divulge to us on that Selective Service card, the race? Somebody, I had read that it said African American, and I don't believe in 1980 that that was a term that was... You know, I've, I've heard those arguments. Um, it's an argument that we're going to just try to stay away from. Uh, we're not going to, we're not pulling in, and I understand what you're asking. We're not going to allow them to pull in a race card. This is not about the race of anybody. This, in the press, in the press conference, Sheriff Ohio made it really clear, this isn't even about the president. We have a fraud, fraudulent document. We have a fraud taking place. It is a document we're pursuing, and we want the people that created this document 
What happens at that point is different. But this is not a race agenda. It is not against the president. And I can tell you this, and I made it really clear. I am a Republican. If this was a Republican president, I'd be fighting this even harder. Not going to happen. So. I recently received some information, and I'd like to verify if it's correct or not. Um, I was told that Sheriff Ohio, part of his duties is to uh, verify the eligibility of a candidate for, for the office of president before he can be put on the Arizona ballot. Is that correct or not? No, sir. One of the most shocking things we discovered, and if we do another press conference, I'll, I'll provide that evidence. Well, two things. Number one, in Arizona, there are no statutory protections stopping anyone from going on a ballot. That's what this initiative is all about. Anybody who pays the money, signs the paper, and just attests to being who they say they are, can get on the ballot to be president. There is no vetting of that candidate by any law enforcement agency. And that actually goes forth across the nation. The vetting process for the President of the United States, and now it's going to come full circle for you, is done by the loyal opposition, and it is done by the media. Now you see why our system is broken. Never in, I know my lifetime, and I'm sure everybody else's, have you seen media so in the bag on one side. So you can't possibly use that. It is not the sheriff's duty to do it. The Secretary of State by statute doesn't have the authority or the ability to do it. So there's a problem. And I'm going to take it one step further before you. We secure documents from the United States Government Employee, employee Services. The question was asked, who vets the presidential candidate or who vets the president? The answer came back the Constitution, and nobody vets the candidate. There is no FBI, NSA, CIA. The sheriff gave a bunch of letters to those. He knows them all. Nobody does it. However, if you want a job in the federal government to take out the trash, you have to pledge allegiance to the United States of America, and you have to provide so much documentation, you almost don't want the job. You have to provide a valid birth certificate to play Little League. But to be the President of the United States, you're not even really required to do that. So that's why I want to put this in perspective for you. We're a cold case unit. We go back in time. We are not investigating the President of the United States. We are investigating the then candidate, Barack Obama, and the potential to be the future candidate, Barack Obama. So to put this in the right context for you, that birth certificate really doesn't matter about the first go-around election because it wasn't offered up. But it is going to be in 2012. And you can look at some of the events that took place. All of a sudden, you had Donald Trump really pushing for a birth certificate then all of a sudden there is a production of a birth certificate. All right, now I'm going to confess to you. You ever cheat in school? Did you ever see little Johnny all of a sudden waving the homework because somebody passed it to him? That's what that press conference reminded me of. Little Billy just handed off the test to little Johnny, and he's going, here it is, teacher. And there it is. And I think what they wanted to do was quell this argument going forward. Except within about 30 minutes of that thing being launched on the internet that the president himself said, this is proof positive of my birth. People in the citizenry, software people were going, oh my God, this is fake. Within 30 minutes. That's a problem. They have that thing out there, he's attesting to it. That document is now in play, and every representation now is in play going into 2012. Sir.
Can you tell us what the statute of limitations is for fraud and forgery uh, as a federal offense once the, once the crime is discovered? I, I, I don't remember off the top of my head if it's five or seven years on a federal statute. What is it, sir? Seven years? Seven years on a federal statute. statute. However, it's when it's been discovered. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Sheriff Ohio is the only one who's discovered it because he's the only one who called it what it is. So we've got a long time to go. The other thing I want you to keep in mind during our investigation, we've also learned that the Democratic National Committee are the ones that certify their candidate. And in that certification of nomination paperwork, they omit the constitutional language saying that he meets the constitutional requirements. And they submit this to your Secretary of State. The Republican paperwork that we could track, and we've been back to Clinton era, and we pulled as much of it as we could, the Republican side still holds the constitutional provision. So you have to ask yourself, why is that? That's one thing that the Secretary of State should do, is demand they be equal and uniformed. That's one issue there. Go ahead, man. Um, so that, that means, oh, can, if you can prove conspiracy, then would you be able to go back and actually charge those that omitted that information? I, I'm not interested. I charge you with what? Well, oh, on the DNC yes, side? Yes. You know, that, that's a federal matter. That's not something we're going to do. That would be something that the federal government is going to do. Um, there's your answer. You know, sometimes now I wish the sheriff was still a federal <laughs> law enforcement officer. We get a lot more done. Okay. Um, the documents. In all modern photography equipment, have the ability to put GPS stamps on photographs. If there are any photographs in these documents, were you able to find those GPS stamps indicating where those photographs were taken? On these documents, there are no photographs. They, they take a picture no. of the stamps. No. no, no, it's a photocopy of a card. They just they just took a photocopy and sent it out under a FOIA request. Um, you know, we do know the metadata, in other words, we do know where the, where the document was, we know the make of the computer that it was sitting in, we know where it was, not so much the physical location, but what computer make and model it was sitting in before it was uploaded, that's as far back as, as we're able to go.